Hello everyone. This is Vaseem from Edureka and I welcome you all to this session in which I am going to talk about Python programming. So let's take a look at the agenda for this session. First of all, I will give you a brief introduction about Python programming language. After that, we will go through the basics with interesting programs. I will also give you a few questions in between the session for clearer perspective. And moving further, I will talk about a few applications of Python programming language. And then I will discuss a few projects that we can work on to brush our skills. And finally, I will tell you the difficulties faced by beginners and how Edureka will help you in learning Python programming language. I hope you guys are clear with the agenda. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Edureka for more exciting tutorials and press the bell icon to get the latest updates on Edureka. And do check out the Edureka's Python certification program. The link is given in the description box below. Now, without wasting any more time, let us begin our journey with Python programming. Python is an open source object oriented programming language. It first appeared in 1991 and has become extremely popular among the data scientists. It emerged as a hobby project by Guido von Rossum and has actually become the most popular programming language in recent times. The applications vary from Medicare, we can use it for finance, we are use it in sports industry, you name it and Python has already made its mark in the industry. So let's take a look at what exactly is Python. Python is a general purpose programming language. It is very easy to learn. It has a very easy syntax and readability is one of the reasons why developers are switching to Python from other programming languages. And we can use Python as object oriented and procedure oriented language as well. It is open source and has tons of libraries for various implementations. Python also has a very large community of developers experience in their respective fields and has actually surpassed the Java users in numbers. So right now around 8.2 million users have switched to Python as a primary programming language. A large community like Python gives you a bigger perspective on simple problems and actually provides better alternate logic and implementation for simple programs. On the other hand, Edureka also has a very large community of developers where you can simply put some questions that you have doubt with and you can also answer a few other questions that you can find on the community. So let's also take a look at Python version that has come into being after the first release. So here's a list of Python stable releases that you can use for Python programming. So right now the latest stable release is Python 3.811 which came last year and cannot be used for Windows XP and earlier. Before that we had Python 3.7.6, we had 3.6.10 and 3.5.6. And if you wish to use Windows XP or earlier, you can use the stable release Python 2.7.17 as well. And to find out the various versions to download, you can simply go to python.org and search for the files that you want to download. The installation is pretty easy and very user friendly, but make sure when you install Python, you tick the set path in the checkbox to avoid setting up the Python path manually. The other prominent IDs that you can use for Python programming are PyCharm and Jupyter Notebook, which comes under Anaconda. So we will be working on PyCharm in this session, guys. And I will also show you how you can check the Python version on your system. So I'll just open the command prompt to show you how it works. So to check your Python version after the installation, you can simply write Python or if you just write Python over here, it will tell you the Python version that is Python 3.7.3 and has opened the interactive for me. So I'll just exit this and to check the version, I'll just write version over here and it will give me the version. So I'm using Python 3.7.3 guys. So this is how you can check the Python version after you have installed it on your system. And uh, to make it clearer, I will also show you simple graph representation using Jupyter Notebook at the end of the session. So before moving on to the Python basics, let us also understand why Python should be your first programming language. So there are various reasons that you should choose Python for. The first one is it is very user friendly and it is open source. So it opens a lot of doors for you for various opinions, recommendations and help that you can get on the community. Talking about community Python has a very large community that can help you as a beginner or if you are a developer also and you come across some problems or difficulties. It's easier if you have a big community working on the same. The next prominent thing that you can think of is Python is very scalable. So in any application that you can think of right now Python can be used or is being used already. So with that said Python also opens a lot of job opportunities for you guys. So right now the market is booming and people are looking for Python developers with skill set that is useful for their organization. Now let's cut to the chase guys and begin Python programming. So we'll be talking about Python basics in this. So I'll be covering variables data types and then I'll be talking about functions operators. I'll be talking about conditional statements and loops as well. 
So don't worry guys, please hang in there. I'll be talking about a lot of programs that you can make with all these basic concepts that I'm going to talk about and I'll also give you a few exercises that you can practice to brush up your skills on these uh, basic concepts. So I'll be making a few programs like guess the number program. Then I will be making adventure program using strings. So hang in there guys. I'll be beginning with the concepts like variables first of all. So let's take it up to PyCharm guys. So we have our basics over here. Okay, so this is PyCharm. Uh, if you don't know much about PyCharm guys, we have a full tutorial on how you can start your journey on Python using PyCharm. Okay, I'll open the terminal. I'll show you how you can just simply use the terminal as well. So we use command prompt to check the version of Python. We can do that in PyCharm as well using this command. So we'll be starting with variables first of all. So I'll be talking about naming convention, how you can declare a variable, how you assign a value to a variable and multiple assignment as well. So let's go to PyCharm again guys. So first of all, what is a Python variable? Python variable is a reserved memory location to store values. I mean, in other words, a variable in Python program gives data to the computer for processing and every value in Python has a data type. So there are a few rules with Python variables. So first of all, a variable name must start with a letter or underscore character and then a variable name cannot start with a number. And after that, we have one more rule, which is a variable name can only contain alphanumeric characters and underscores. And last but not the least variable names are case sensitive which means okay i'll just show you guys so let me just take one variable name i'll name it as python so this is one string i'm using i'll be talking about this in data types because string comes under data types guys so when i print my variable name so with these two statements i've shown you how you can declare a variable how you can assign a value to it and how you can call the variable in other statement which is print statement so when I print this, I'm getting the output as Python, which is the value of my variable over here. So it is as simple as that. Next thing I want to show you how you can assign multiple values. Like I'll write course also, let's say. So to declare that course value as well in the variable, I'll just write it as let's say Python certification. Yes, put it in the print statement. Print and I'm getting the output as Python and Python certification, which is actually my variable that I've called in the print statement. Now one more thing I want to talk to about is let's say I have a name variable which has a value Python and I print this variable name and again I take this variable name and uh, name it as let's say certification. Now when I print name again, so here's a quick question for you guys. So when I execute this program which has two print statements and I have the same variable name. What do you think the output will be? So write in the comments guys and I'll show you what the output is. So the output is Python and after that it is certification. So I have actually assigned multiple values to the same variable. So this is one thing you can do with Python guys and I'm going to show you how it changes with the uppercase letters and lowercase letters. Okay, I'll just take it as X and this also I'll take it as a lowercase letter X. We'll use only one print statement x and x comment this out when I execute this. So we have the same variables with the same name, but they are actually in different cases. So they are treated as two different variables. So this is as far as it goes with Python variables guys. Although there are a few other things that I want to talk about, which is global variable and local variable. So we'll be taking a look at that when we are working on functions. So moving on, let's take a look at the next concept that we have, which is data types in Python. So basically we have six type of data types in Python and we have collections module as well, which has advanced data structures, but we'll be focusing on the basic ones right now. So which are numbers strings. We have lists tuple sets and a dictionary. So we'll be taking a look at all of these one by one. So let's take it up to PyCharm again. I'll clear this off and right now let's talk about numbers. So numbers are basically numerical data type which holds a numerical value. So let's say I have a variable. Let's say X and I give it a value 100. So it holds a numerical value. So it's a number. Now when I print this, I'll get this value. But if I want to check the type of this variable, I'll use the type function. And when I print it again, okay, I have an error over here. Now when I print this again, I have the class integer. So numbers are basically of four types. We have float integer complex and boolean. So an integer is nothing but a normal number and if I add a decimal point value to this, let's say two five and when I print this again, it will show me the class float because this has become a floating point value for this number. And if I add an imaginary part to this, 
like 100 plus 5j so we denote j with the imaginary part and when i print this again the class will become complex and to check if it's boolean or not so we're gonna use our operator over here so we'll be talking about this comparison operator later on in the session so don't worry guys if i print x right now so we know that it's a class bool it's a boolean variable or a boolean integer it's gonna give me true or false so it's a decisive parameter actually so if i write it as let's say is equal or less than is equal to it's gonna give us at false so this is all about integers or numbers in data types guys next up we have strings so strings in python are used to represent unicode character values and python does not have a character data type even a single character is also considered as a string so i'll just clear this off let's take one more variable and we'll name it as python only because we have already worked on this and when i print name should be adding python so this is a simple implementation of a string like how do you declare it and how do you call it in a function or something like that or a simple method like print statement now i want to talk about slicing and indexing as well that you can do with the strings so slicing is basically you know okay i'll just try to get only a few letters from this string the whole string that is python so i'll just try three so what this will do is it will fetch me the character value or the string and the index number three so it will start from here so at p the index number will be zero we'll go until here at uh, number three index we have h so we have got that in the output as well after that we have negative indexing or oh, wait i have to talk about slicing as well so i'll just add a colon over here and let's say i write six so it will fetch me the number starting from three and ending at index number six so this is how slicing works in uh, strings guys and we also have a few methods that we can use with the string like replace we have strip format find title count we have index and capitalize case fold center and code ends with so all these uh, methods also are there for string that you can use and let me show you how you can concatenate two strings so let's say i have name and i want to add a value let's say programming so what should be the output guys so when i print this i have this whole value that i've concatenated two strings over here but instead i just want to add let's say 10 over here so it will throw me an error which is a type error and it will only concatenate string not integer to the string so what i'll do is i'll use the string constructor put it inside a string and it will add the two strings together so this is a simple implementation of using strings how you can use them and indexing as well so let's move on to the next data type that we have which is lists in python so a list is ordered and changeable so one more thing i forgot about strings that i want to talk about which is if i have a string let's say python yes and uh, i print this name executed i'm getting the value as python so let's say i want to change a value and i'm change the value at the index number two so instead of t i want let's say h so i'll put in and now when i print name again i should get the updated string right but we don't do that in strings because strings are immutable in nature so once you have already declared a string you cannot change it back to any other value or change it at all so anytime you try to do that you will get a type error which will show you something like this like a string object does not support item assignment same thing will happen with the tuple so we'll be getting on to that as well so let's talk about list now so to declare a list okay i'll take a as my list you have to use the square brackets and inside this i can put any values like 10 20 i can put strings i can even put floating point values or any other data type that i want so when i print my list over here i get the output as something like this so this is my list guys now there are a few methods that you can use on list so there is reverse or append count index clear copy extend insert remove all these methods that you can use inside a list so i let's say i want to insert object or one more element inside my list so i'll use the insert function inside this i have to put like what i have to add and at what index number i want it to be right so i'll write the index number as let's say five and when i print a again okay this is the index number that we have to specify and this is the value that i've put over here so instead of five let's say i want programming as you can see i have successfully added a element inside my list so it's pretty easy to work with list guys 
and let's say if I have one more list B is equal to let's say I have values like one two three four and five and with each element you have to separate it by a comma otherwise it will throw you an error guys and I have to add this inside a list so I want both of these lists A and B inside one list that is going to be C so I'll just use an additional operator print C now and let's see the output is so I have successfully concatenated all these two strings so accessing a value inside a list works the same way as strings guys so if I have like five values over here let's say and I want to access any values from the string I'll just use the indexing so I'll use five as my index first of all so it will give me the number or the element that is stored at the index number five same thing with the slicing so I'll start with five and go until minus one let's say okay so if I slice this and if I want to go from uh, starting index that is going to be zero and go until five the output would be it will fetch me all these values inside this range and instead of this I can use negative indexing as well so what exactly is negative indexing guys so negative indexing is it will start from over here at the end of the list so this will be the minus one index this will be minus two minus three and so on so if I write minus let's say five over here it is going to give me the element at the index number minus five so that is all about negative indexing as well so now that we are done with the lists as well let's talk about tuple guys so what exactly is a tuple tuple is a collection which is unchangeable or immutable so to declare a tuple you have to use the round brackets and you can put any value let's say one two three four five I put a string as well let's say Eureka and declare it let's print a so I have a tuple over here but I've said that it is immutable so which means that it works like strings like I have shown you so if I want to change the value at index number six let's say instead of that number at six I want to write Python let's say and I want to print a again it's going to throw me the same error which is tuple object does not support item assignment so this is all about tuple guys I want to show you a few methods that you can have with tuples so you can count and there's an index so let's say I want to count okay let's put it as six and this also six so I want to six it will give me the count of that element inside put it in the print statement so when I execute this I'm getting the count as number three because we have six three times over here same goes with the index so I can actually check the index value or at any given point so let's say I want the index value of number six but in this case we have three number sixes over here like the number six has actually occurred three times so here's a quick question for you guys what do you think the index value would be for this number over here so put it in the comments guys and I'll just run it for you yes so it is giving us the index value as number three which is zero one two and three why not number four or number five because when this program executes it will only take the index value at the first element that it encounters so let's say I have number six over here or we can take number two and a number two over here as well and if I check the number two value or the index at number two element I will get the index value as one so this is how it works guys we have two methods in tuple and that is all about tuples guys let's move on to the next data type that is sets in Python so a set is a collection which is unordered and it does not have any indexes as well so to declare a set in Python we use the curly brackets so let's say I have a set and I have all these values and when I print my set over here let's see what the output is wait I have so many elements over here but I only have four elements in my set why does that happen because in a set you cannot have any duplicate values as you have seen in a list and in a tuple as well you can have multiple values for a single element but in a set you cannot have any duplicate values and that is how a set works so we'll take a look at all these methods that you can have in a set which is update pop add then you can clear copy difference difference update discard intersection intersection update is disjoint and all these methods that you can use inside a set guys to access an element inside a set what do you have to do because it does not support any indexing let's say I write four over here I want to print this value at the index number four but a set does not support indexing so how would that work we are given a type error which says a set object is not subscriptable which is it does not have any indexes so that is all about sets guys 
and let me just talk about the next data type that we have which is a dictionary. So a dictionary is just like any other collection array in Python, but they have key value pairs and a dictionary is unordered and changeable as well. So to declare a dictionary, I have to use the curly brackets and give it values like a key value pair. So I can give it a value like this one. I'll name it as let's say Python separated by a comma. The next key value pair will come. Let's say certification. So this is my dictionary guys. I'll print a let's see what the output is. So we have these two key value pairs and this is how you declare a dictionary in Python and to access any values you can simply use the key values and it will give you the value inside the key value pair. So if I use key value one, it will give me Python. If I use it as two, it will give me certification and let's take a look at a few methods that we have in dictionary like we have update. We have keys values like if I do values over here, if I print the values, let's see what the output is. We have certification and dictionary values It's Python and certification. So these are the values. And instead of let's say values, if I write keys, it will give me the value of the keys, which is one and two. But uh, do you see like we are getting a tuple and inside a tuple we are getting a list. So this is how we are getting these keys and values inside this. And other methods include update, like updating a value, and you can pop values, pop item as well. Like you can get values and from key, set default, clear, copy, all these methods that you can use. So that is all about dictionary, guys. Let's move on to the next topic that we have, which is operators. So in Python, we have seven types of operators, which is arithmetic operator, assignment operator. We have comparison operator, logical operator, membership operator. We have identity operator and bitwise operators. So let's talk about them each one by one in detail. So basically our operators are used to perform operations on variables and values and Python divides these operators in the groups that I've already told you about. So let's take a look at arithmetic operators. So arithmetic operators are used with numerical values to perform common mathematical operations. So let's say, okay, I'll take two variables. First of all, give it some numerical value. Now comes the part where I'm going to use the arithmetic operators. So what I'll do is I'll add these numbers too. So I'll use a print statement X plus Y. So let's see what the output is. It's going to give me the addition of these two values that is X and Y. So instead of this, we have addition operator. We have subtraction operator as well, but it's subtraction arithmetic operator. So it's going to give me the subtraction of these two values. Instead of this, I can use a multiplication operator as well. So it's going to give me the multiplication of these two values and we can use a division operator as well. So it's going to give me the division, which is 0.5. So these are the basic operations. After this, we have exponentiation as well. So if I write double asterisk over here, it's going to mean that we are going to exponentiate like it's going to be 10 to the power 20. And when I do the execution, I'm going to get the value like this. So to make it more believable, let's make it as five and make it three. So five to the power three actually means 125. So we're getting the value as 125. And similarly, let's make it as 15 or let's say 16. We can use the double division operator as a floor division operator. So it's going to give us the floor division that is five over here. And we also have a modulus symbol as well, which is going to give us the modulus of the two values. That is one. So this is all about arithmetic operators guys that we have in Python. So let's talk about assignment operators, which are used to assign values to variables like this is equal to also is a assignment operator. But after that, let's say if I want to write X is equal to X plus some value, let's say two, I can simply write this statement as X plus is equal to two. And when I print this, it's going to give me the same result, which is 16 plus 2, that is 18. Okay, we have invalid syntax. We have done a mistake over here. I cannot just put this inside a print statement. When I print X now, it will give me the value of X as 18. Similarly, I can use it for Y is equal to, let's say, or Y minus is equal to 2. I can write X, or it's, I'll write it after this X multiplication is equal to 2, or X division is equal to 2. So let's see the output guys understand the chronology here. So first of all, we had the value 18 right here. After this, we do a multiplication by 2. So we get 36 after that we divided by 2. So we get 18. So this is how assignment operators are used to assign values to variables in Python. After that comparison operators 
are used to compare two values. So we'll put a statement over here. So let's say I have a statement a which says or we can just compare two values like 5 is equal to or we can just write x is equal to 5. One more statement would be like x is not equal to 5, right? And after that we can have like x is greater than y. We can have x not greater or less than y. And we can have less than equal to or we can also have greater than equal to. So all these statements are comparison operators. So we're going to use these while we are working on the conditional statements because that's where you will be understanding this better. Let's take a look at the next operators that we have which is logical operators which are used to combine conditional statements. So let's say if I have a statement x is equal to 5 and x is equal to 3 and x is equal to let's say 3 and when I print this So when I print this I'm getting it as false because for a logical and operator both the statement has to be true. It is still false guys. So if I write it as let's say 5 here and make it as less than or equal to 3 or write as greater than or equal to 3 it's going to give me the output as true because both the statements over here are true and we are using the logical and operator. But let's say if I have it is equal to like the last statement and if I add the logical or operator it's going to give me the value as true only because for a logical or operator only one of the statement has to be true and after this we have a not operator as well so I can just write not and whatever value I have for this statement that is my or operator so for this I was getting true as the output if I add the logical not operator it's going to give me as false because whatever you get after the statement and if you use the logical not operator it's going to negate it. So if you're getting true you'll get false and if you're getting false you'll get true. So this is all about the logical operators in Python. After that comes the identity operators which are used to compare the objects and not if they are equal but if they are actually the same object and with the same memory location. So we'll take a look at the identity operators and we'll also take a look at membership operators which are used to test if a sequence is presented in an object or not. So let's say if a is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and let's say I want to check 1 in a. I want to print this. So what will be the output? So it's going to just check if the operator that I'm using here that is the membership in operator is going to check if a sequence that is number 1 over here is present in the list or not. Since it is there it is giving me as the output as true. If I write it as 8 let's say it's going to give me the output as false. So this is a membership operator that we are talking about. After this we can check like not in. So it's simply going to give true as the output your 8 is not there and if I change it to let's say 2 it's going to give me at false because 2 is already present in the list. So let's talk about the identity operator that is is. So let's see if we can put it inside this. Okay. So let's say we have a list over here which is A we get one more list okay, let make it as b i'm using the list constructor over here similarly we have an integer constructor for type conversion basically we can use dictionary tuple and set as well so i'll just declare this uh, list orthodoxically i'll write one two three four so i'm checking if b is not a it's going to give the value as true because we're using the identity operator and i'm actually comparing the objects I'm not checking if they are equal, but I'm actually checking if they are actually the same object with the same memory location. Or if I check B is A, it's going to give me the value as false because B is not A. So this is all about operators in Python guys. And last but not least, we have a bitwise operator as well, which I used to compare binary numbers. So let's say I want to check if A. Okay, let's say I have a value A is equal to 10. And B is equal to 12. And I'm going to print using the bitwise operator A, bitwise, and B. So, what will be the output, guys? I'm getting the output as 8 over here. So, how is that possible, guys? So, if we write A in binary numbers, that is 10, it will basically be equal to 1010. Yes? And if we write B, it will be equal to 1100. So, the point here is if you are using the logical AND operator and if these two values this one and this one 
are both equal to one then the value will be equal to one and if it's not or if any of the value is different we'll change it to zero so in this we only have one value that is similar that is this one and this one so the resultant would, would automatically become one zero 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 which in decimal number is equal to eight similarly we can do this for or that is logical or operator but with this if we have a similar value that is zero and zero there will be nothing if we have one and zero like one value is one and one is not we'll still change it to one so if i run this again we'll get the value somewhat like 14. so for 14 we will have the resultant as one 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 and zero so if i convert it to decimal we'll have 14. after that we have a bitwise xor and x naught so xor will actually you know take the values only if one of the values are different so when i do xor of this we'll get the resultant as 0 1 1 0 which is equal to 6 and if i do a not operator we will use okay we are making a mistake over here so i'll just write it as not b so we're getting the value as minus 13 because it will change all these values to their counterparts or these values after that we have shifting operators so if i write a and b we'll get the values as 40960 we'll shift it two points so we'll get the value as 40 and if i shift left it'll get the points as two so these are all the bitwise operators that we have in python guys so let's move on to the next topic that we have which is functions in python so in this section i'm going to tell you how you can create a function call a function and i'm going to talk about the lambda functions as well so let's take it up to pycharm guys i'll show you a simple uh, pattern program to find out how you can actually define a function so to define a function you have to use this keyword that is def after this you can just name your function that you want and you can use parameter as well so i'll write n over here which is going to be the parameter in my function and you have to make sure the idents are pretty clear so i'll just write for i in range don't worry guys i'll be talking about the for loops and everything later on in the session so it's just an example how you can or you can just write let's say print you know, a simple print statement like this is my function yes and if i print this or execute this i'm getting nothing although my print statement is there so it should be executed right but i'm not getting any values in my output so here's a quick question guys why do you think this is happening put it inside the comments and tell me why or what is wrong with this program right now and so, okay let's move on i'll tell you what's wrong with this program anyway so we have to call this function in order to print this statement so what i'll do is i'll just write pattern and I have used a parameter over here, so I'll just remove it. And uh, when I call it, let's see what the output is. I'm getting the output as this is my function. So basically, I'm making a call to my function over here. And let's say if I have n over here, and if I write it as let's say five, what is going to happen? Nothing. I'm just passing this argument over here, which is in my parameter in the function. So this is a simple example of how you can use or how you can actually call a function. After this, I want to talk about lambda functions, guys. So, what exactly are lambda functions? A lambda function is nothing but a small anonymous function, and a lambda function can take any number of arguments, but can only have one expression. So, I'll just tell you how you can do it. Like x is equal to, or we can call it as say name is equal to lambda a a plus let's say 10. When I execute this, I'm getting no values, right? So, when I call my lambda function or when I call my function over here let's say name we have a lambda function over here or if I want to print a let's say I'm getting the value as name a is not defined because it's in the local scope of the function of lambda function so how are you going to call this function guys now to call this function you simply have to use a print statement use the function name inside this put the value that is over here so we have to put the value of a let me just put the value 5 over here and when I print this I'm going to get the value as 15 because that's my output or I can use a and b like two parameters and I want to let's say get a exponentiation of a and b using the lambda function and I have to give the two values so I'll write as 5 and 5 so I'll be getting the value as 3125 or if I make it as let's say 4 I'll be getting as 625 so this is a simple implementation of a lambda function that you can use and this is how easily you can use functions like define a function you can just simply put a function name 
you know and uh, after the colon you can simply define any statements or you can use conditional statements as well don't worry guys we'll be working on that when we are working on the guess the game program and the adventure game so we'll be talking about that shortly after i finish conditional statements and loops so hang in there so the next topic is conditional statements guys so to explain conditional statements i want to show you an example of factorial of a number so we'll directly go to the pie charm guys so basically we have four types of or three types of conditional statements that is if else if and else and else if in python is written as elif that is e l i f so to do that okay i'll just take a number let's say 7 or we can take it as input from the user as well so i'll just write it as int input and enter your number after this i'm going to take one variable let's say factorial because we are actually calculating the factorial of number and i'm going to check if the number is negative positive or zero so first of all i'm going to use the if statement so i'm checking if the number is greater than zero so if it is i am going to print sorry factorial cannot exist for a negative number okay so here i want to end my if statement after this i'm going to use the else statement or we use the elif statement that is the second statement that i want to check so the flow is something like this i put a statement so when the execution starts it's going to check if number that is 7 is it less than 0 if this statement is true it will enter the if block and it will execute this statement but if this is false it will directly go to the next statement which is my else if statement so for this i want to check if number is is equal to 0 so after this is false it's going to check if this is actually true and if it is it's going to print the factorial of 0 is 1 yes after this i want to give one more statement that is my ultimate statement like if both of these are false it will just go to this statement so inside this i'm just going to put the logic for my factorial so for this i'm using the loop so for i in range 1 number plus 1 so the range that i'm using over here is also a data type guys so range basically does okay i'll tell you one rupee so i'll tell you about this in a while so range is basically this is going to be my starting point and this is going to be my end point like number plus 1 means the range will be from starting from 1 it will go until 7 that is my number plus 1 plus 1 because it will not include the last number that is 8 so that is why i have written number plus 1 and i'm using the for loop so don't worry guys i'll be talking about loops in python as well later on in the session so after this for each value i want to update the value of factorial into factorial so for each value factorial will multiply the value by the number that we have in range and i'll just print the factorial of number is pass factorial over here Yes, so I think we have done it correctly. So let's execute this. So the factorial of seven is five. So instead of this, I want to let's say get the input from my user only. So when I run it again, so it's going to ask me for a number that I have to input. So I'll just write five, enter, and my factorial is one twenty. So this is a simple explanation of how you can use these conditional statements in a program, and I've used it to find out the factorial of a number. So that is all about the conditional statements that we have. also we can use different statements like if i want to actually check let's say so this is my statement guys so i'll start with this after that i can simply put all these statements again so first of all i'm checking sorry all right so first of all if I, i'm only checking if the number is greater than 0 so i don't have to do this but i'm still writing it to show you how you can use the nested if statements So when I run this, I'm going to enter my number. Let's say 10. It's going to give me the factorial of number 10. If I let's say give the value as a negative value, it's not even going to enter the loop because I've already checked it over here in this statement. Nothing. So for this, I can give a else value, like after it ends, else print enter the number again. So if I give a negative value. It's gonna tell me to enter the number again, and for this to happen again, I can do one thing, guys. I can put all of this inside a function, 
yes do a little identification and okay instead of this so i can do one thing guys i can put this inside a function do a little identification again now after printing this i'm going to call function so i'll show you how it works guys so i'm going to enter my number i'm going to enter it as -1 it's going to tell me okay wait name function is not defined it's telling me because it's in the scope of this so that is all about nested if statements as well guys so we'll move on to the next topic that we have which is loops in python so we have a while loop for loop and a nested while loop so we'll remove all this to understand the loops in python guys i'm going to take an example of a pattern program example so we're going to use a few functions so i'll name it as pattern let's say and inside this i'm going to use for loop so for i wait i'll just show you an implementation of a for loop first of all so for let's say for i in range 0 to 10 and the step is 2 i want to print i so the output will be 0 2 4 6 and 8 if i make it 11 i'll have 10 as well so i think this gives you a basic idea of what range is used for so range basically is a data type which will give me a few elements so if i print range of 0 to 10 i get the values starting from 0 until 10 it is a data type so i'll have to put it inside a list to get the actual values so these are the values that are present inside the range so the first one is the starting point and this is the ending point so it's not going to be included inside it so if i write as 11 10 will also be there in the list and there's one more thing we can add which is a step so if i write it as 1 i will have a step as 1 if i write it as 2 as you can see we have a step of 2 like after 0 it will take two steps and go to 2 directly then 4 6 8 and 10 if i make it as 5 then we have five steps exactly so if i write from 100 and i want to come to let's say 10 i should be able to take negative steps so that will be let's say minus 5 i'm taking see starting from 100 95 90 and if i take it as let's say 10 a reverse list So this is how I can use range. So to use it in a for loop, I'll take it as for i in range, say 0 to 10, I want to print i. So I'm getting all these values. All right. After this, let's talk about how it's working actually. So for i in range 0 to let's say 5, when I write print i, what is happening is the loop starts or the execution starts. So in the range, it will go from the zero. So it will go to zero, print i, that is the value of i, exit the loop and come back again because i is in the range. As soon as i is out of the range, the execution will stop. So this is how a for loop works. After this, let's talk about while loop, guys. So for while loop, you have to give a specific statement. Let's say, so while i is uh, let's say greater than or less than ten, yes. I want to print i, and let i will be zero first of all. And after this, I want to increment i with one after each time the loop executes. So as soon as the value becomes ten, or if I write less than equal to, we'll include ten as well. So as soon as the value is e is equal to ten, the loop will stop. So for a while loop you have to give a specific statement first of all which has to be true in order to get inside the loop and execute all the statements inside the loop. So let's take a program guys a pattern program so I'll take a function give a value n that's going to be the argument inside my function guys. So for i in range let's say 0 until n so whatever value of n i am going to specify later on when I execute the function and for j in range I'm using as zero, and let's say i plus one. I want to print an asterisk until the end of the line. So when I execute this, let's see what the output is. We don't have an output. So when I execute this, I have actually declared a pattern program. So I've created a pattern function that is being executed. So I'll do one thing, guys. I'll simply put call my function pattern, name it as five. So to make it clearer. I will add a few. Okay, or if I use backslash n, the pattern would look something like this. 
So I don't want it in the new line. So I'll write it as R backslash R. So my pattern looks something like this. So using a simple for loop or a nested for loop, I'm able to print this pattern of asterisk that I'm using inside a function. So this is a very basic example, guys, that I've shown you. So now that we are done with the basics, let me talk about Python style checker, guys. So what exactly is a Python style checker? So it is basically a tool to check your Python code against some of the style conventions. So it has features like a plugin architecture. It has which basically adding new checks is easy. Then it has a parsable output which jumps to error location in your editor. It is quite small. You just only need one Python file and requires only standard library and it comes with a comprehensive test suite. So this is a very good tool to actually make your Python scripting very clean and you can use it for uh, making readable content when you're writing program. After that there is a small topic that I want to talk about which is how to search for a module or a package. So you can simply look for packages and modules in the Python package index or pydoc.net and python.org or a simple approach is to find the package in the project interpreter using pycharm. So I'll just show you how you can actually look for a package. So you just open file go to settings open project interpreter and over here there's an add symbol over here. So let's say I want numpy. So I'll just find it over here install it using install package or if you want to look for a package that will suit your program or your project that you're making then you have to go to pydoc or you can just simply find it on python.org and now that we are done with all these basics let me get into the fun part of this tutorial guys. So I'm just gonna make a few programs like I'm gonna make a program to guess the number. It's a game basically. So the idea behind the guess the number game is to actually you know similar to like it's a first Python project. The project also uses random module. I'll be talking about how you can use a random module and the program will first randomly generate a number unknown to the user. Okay, I'll just write the program to make it understandable. So we'll start with the import of random. So you don't have to actually install this uh, package or module separately because it's already there and after that I'll take random number or generate a random number that is unknown to you guys. So it, the number has to be between 1 and 99 or we'll just say 49. Yes, so we have generated a random number which is n. So I'm taking this variable guess inside this I'm going to take the input from the user. I'll be like enter your guess. Now while my guess is not equal to while the guess is not equal to n which is my random number. So if guess is greater than n I'll write go lower else if guess is less than n I'll print go higher else print u u win champ and if after this I want to actually take input again. So I'll just guess again. So int input enter again. Same thing here. Yes. And let's say I want to after this I want to use the break statement which is a control flow statement guys. So as soon as we execute this statement. So I want to enter my guess. Let's say I have entered 44. It's saying go lower. I'll write 43. Saying go lower. I'll write 24. Saying go higher. I'll write 28. Say go higher. I'll write 35. Says go higher. I'll write 40. Okay, 38. Saying go lower. 37. So I'll make a few changes over here. So when I guess it right, I want to print you win champ. So let's say 25. It wants me to go lower. Again, I have to put something less than 22. Okay, I'll write 20. 21. Yes. So I win, guys. So this is a very simple example of making this program that is guess the number. So with this example, I hope it's clear to you guys how you can use all these statements that is while loop and the conditional statements. We have used all these comparison operators, all the basics that we have used inside this to create a fun game that is inside which we are guessing a number. So let's take a look at other Python concepts now. So let's talk about Python classes. A class in Python is a blueprint from which specific objects are created. It lets you structure your software in a particular way. And here comes the question how? Classes allow us to logically group our data and function in a way that it is easy to reuse and a way to build upon if need to be. 
so the attributes are data members which is class variables and instance variables and methods which are accessed by dot notification a class variable is a variable that is shared by all the different class objects and instances of a class and instance variables are the variables which are unique to each instance and it is defined inside a method and belongs only to the current instance of a class now methods are also called as functions which are defined in a class and describes the behavior of an object so let's move ahead and see how it works to get started first we have to look at the syntax of a python class so to declare a class you just have to write class name of your class it is as simple as that so if i write it just like say if i'm giving a variable x is equal to 5 now i'll have to make an object so for that i'll make it as let's say a is equal to employee and now i'm going to print a dot x so let's see what the output is guys so it's giving me the output as 5 so this is how simple you can work with the classes now let, let me just deep dive a little i'll explain how you can use the init function so first of all i'll declare my class let's say employee and i'll define a function guys init function so i'll add a few more things here like first last and let's say salary also and now i'm going to use the self dot f name is equal to first self dot f last name is equal to last self dot salary is equal to sal and self dot let's say email is equal to i'll write it as first plus plus last at the rate let's say company now we have defined a function over here so i'll make a employee one let's say employee give it some values so first of all i have to give the first name let's say i give it as eddie raker all right i'll just give it as python last name i'm gonna give let's say eddie raker salary let's say we give it as ten thousand and employee two again employee give it some values let's say data science eddie raker now print employee one dot email and print employee two dot email so let's see the output is okay we have an invalid syntax guys should work fine now so we have our output as python at the rate edureka and data science dot edureka at the rate company.com so this is how simply you can use classes in python guys this is a very simple example of uh, you know getting all these details from this function that i made over here and these are the objects that i have created and this is how you simply work with the classes now let me talk about rather complex uh, concept which is inheritance in python so the method of inheriting the properties of parent class into a child class is known as inheritance it is an object oriented programming concept so the benefits of inheritance are code reusability like we do not have to write the same code again and again and we can just inherit the properties we need in a child class it represents real world relationship between parent class and a child class and it is transitive in nature which means if a child class inherits properties from a parent class then all the other subclasses of the child class will also inherit the same properties of the parent class so let's take a simple example to understand this so let's take a parent class and in this i'm going to define a function let's say first and we'll print like first function this is a very simple example guys i just want to show you how it works the inheritance in python so after this i take one more class and let's name it as child inside this i'm gonna give the instance over here like that is parent and i'm gonna define one more function let's say second and i'm gonna print second function create an object now i just call the first function because i've inherited that and call the second function so with this example i'm able to show you that we using the object of the child class i'm able to call the function from the parent class as well so this is how inheritance works guys this is a very simple example and now let's just move to the next concept that is python modules so modules are simply a program logic or a python script that can be used for a variety of applications or functions we can declare functions classes etc in a module so let's say if i have a function for adding two numbers yes and inside this i just wanna like a and b and when i call this function add i just give two values let's say put in a print statement and it's going to give me the addition of these two numbers so this is my simple example of you know 
making a function. So what if I tell you guys like the focus is to break down the code into different modules when you're working in modules so that there will be no or minimum dependencies on one another. So using modules in a code helps to write lesser lines of codes a single procedure developed for your reuse of the code as well. So it also eliminates the need to write the same code logic again and again. So I can do one thing like make a few definition of uh, functions like addition and subtraction multiplication division finding out a power and put it inside a module like declare a module with the same number and I can simply call that module in my script and I don't have to write the logic of that again and again. So that is one advantage of using Python modules. Now one more advantage of using Python modules is that programs can be designed easily since a whole team works on only one part of the module of the entire code. Suppose you want to make a program for a calculator let's say. So there will be operations like addition then you need subtraction there'll be multiplication division etc. So we will break the code into separate parts and we can simply create one module for all these operations or separate modules for each of the operations and then we can call these modules in our main program logic. So the idea is to minimize the code and if we create modules it doesn't mean we can only use it for this program. We can even call the modules for other programs as well. Now comes the part where we're going to talk about the built in modules in Python. So built in modules are written in C and integrated with Python interpreter. So each built in module contains resources for certain specific functionalities like operating system management disk input output etc. And the standard library also has many Python scripts containing useful utilities. So there are several built in modules in Python at our disposal that we can use whenever we want. So let's take a look at a few built in modules in Python for better understanding. So let's take a look at math module. So which is simply you have to write import math. Now the math module is a built in Python library. It helps in numerous mathematical functions following the C standard and it works only on the real numbers. So let's see what all we can do with math. Like we can get a factorial of a number. So let's say if I put in a print statement. You can simply get the factorial of this number using math module in Python guys. So I've told you like you don't have to write the same logic again and again and this is how math module helps us like instead of factorial we can even get power like we have to give two values let's say so it's going to give us 10 square which is 100 and we can get the value of pi and there's so much other functions that we can use it for like I'll show you what all we can do factorial log then there is power square root a cos a cos h a sin a sin h a tan etc. So let's take a look at the other module that I'm going to talk about which is random module. So functions in the random module depend on the pseudo random number generator which is the function random and which generates a random float number between 0 and 1 that is 0.0, .0 and 1.0. So let me just show you how it works. So I'm just gonna import random and let's print random dot random. Let's see what the output is. So it will generate each time I execute this program it will generate a random number. So as you can see this is how it works. I'll also show you one more implementation of uh, random number when we are working on later on in the session and now talking about the next module which is date time module. So a date in Python is not a data type of its own but we can import a module named date time to work with the dates as date objects. So I'll just import date time and let's say I want to print the date for today and date and time for exactly right now. So what I'll do is I'll write date time dot I can get date and date time as well. So I'll just write now. So it's going to give me the date that is 16 January 2020 and the time is right now 131. So this is how it works. So now that we are done with the Python modules as well. Let me give you a quick tour of the Jupyter notebook and I'll also introduce few important Python libraries with examples. So let's just open Jupyter guys. So this is my Jupyter notebook guys. I'll open a Python 3 file. Okay, I hope this is visible to you guys. I'll make it a more visibility. I'll add to it. So this is Jupyter notebook guys. First of all, I'll change it as let's say basics. Now, first of all, I'm going to talk about Python NumPy. So NumPy is a Python package which stands for numerical Python and it is the core library for scientific computing which contains a powerful n dimensional array object. So provide the tools for integrating C, C++ etc. It is also useful in linear algebra or random number capability etc. So NumPy array can be used as an efficient multi-dimensional container for generic data. So let me just tell you exactly how Python NumPy array works. So Python NumPy array is a powerful n-dimensional array object which is in the form of rows and columns and we can initialize NumPy arrays from nested Python lists and access the elements inside it. 
So in order to perform these NumPy operations, let me just show you how you can simply create a NumPy array. So first of all, you have to import NumPy. Okay, NumPy as NP. Give it an alias as well. I just have to make one array, let's say. Inside this, I'll declare a list. So this is simply how you can use the NumPy to create NumPy arrays. So next up, we'll talk about Python pandas. So pandas is used for data manipulation, analysis, and cleaning. And Python pandas is well suited for different kinds of data such as tabular data with heterogeneously typed columns, ordered and unordered time series data, arbitrary matrix data with row and column tables. And we have unlabeled data, any form of observational or statistic data sets, we can use Python pandas for it. So let us see how we can make a data frame using the pandas library. So first of all, you have to import pandas, give it alias as PD. Now after this, I'm gonna take a variable, let's say, web give it some values in a dictionary let's say first value will be day like one two three four five and six on seven like day of the weeks and then let's say visitors okay we'll just put it inside this dictionary only okay visitors let's say i'm gonna put it inside a list and uh, let's say thousand on day one 200 on day two 345 on day 3 and so on like random numbers I'm giving After this give it some more values like bounce rate Okay to make it clear Similarly, let's say 20 30 2 20 30 40 20 Now let's create a data frame using the pandas library guys. So I'll write my data frame as df so using pd I'll create a data frame web let's see if i can do that no errors there guys so i'm just gonna print my data frame now so this is my data frame guys which i have actually made using this data and using the pandas library so this is a very simple implementation of pandas library in python guys so let's take a look at the next library that i'm going to talk about which is matplotlib so matplotlib is a plotting library used for 2d graphics in python programming language so it can be used in Python scripts, shell, web application servers, and other graphical user interface toolkits. There are several toolkits which are available that extend Python matplotlib functionality, and some of them are separate downloads. So others can be shipped with the matplotlib source code, but have external dependencies, like Basemap, Cartopy, we have Excel tools, matplot3d, and NatGrid. So let's just take a simple example to plot a graph using matplotlib. So I'll just import Or we can just write it as import pyplot as plt. So no errors here, guys. So I have successfully imported the pyplot library or pyplot module from matplotlib. And to plot a graph, let's say I'm plotting to my canvas. So for that, let's say plt dot. This is a very simple plot, guys. I'm gonna get a line for this. Like one, two, three. 4, 5, or let's say 1. So this is how you can plot simple graphs using matplotlib. And now let me just show you an example using a data set. So let us take a look at an example of probability density estimation repeat. So let me show you an example of probability density estimation using matplotlib and numpy. So this is a complex example guys. It will show you how you can use these libraries to plot something. So I'll import. Okay, I've already done that. So I won't. So I'll just import from numpy dot random import normal. Yes. So I'm gonna make a sample again now for normal. Let's just say size is equal to one two thousand, and I'm gonna plot the histogram for this. Use the sample bins is equal to let's say fifty. So this is how I get my probability density estimation using matplotlib and numpy. So it is just to show you how you can use these libraries guys. It is a very introductory example. So now that we're done with the basics, let's take a look at a few applications of Python programming language. So although the Python application range is immense and too large to cover in one session, I will give you a brief about how Python can be used for different applications. So first of all, we have Python web development. So Python can be used in Python web development with top notch library and framework support such as Django. We have flask bottle. Web to Pi, Cherry Pi, which are the top five frameworks in Python, and they are both micro frameworks and full stack framework for web development. 
and some of the projects that you can make with these frameworks include a product landing page or an online portfolio an e-commerce e website a blog space etc after that comes data science so python can be used for data science starting from extraction or collecting data to data manipulation data preparation and building complicated models to solving problems python actually has a very large support or a very large library support for data science starting from libraries like pandas matplotlib seaborn scikit-learn scipy etc it is considered the best programming language for data science in the market right now some of the projects that you can make using python for data science include exploratory data analysis or a fraud detection inside any organization or using the data that we have and you can use it for target marketing and you can use it for website recommendation system etc after that comes machine learning so coming to machine learning with python python scikit-learn library has built-in support for various machine learning algorithms that stands it apart from other programming languages you just have to fit the training data in a classifier and then you can simply make prediction models with top-notch accuracy plus cross validation gives an edge into making efficient machine learning models some of the projects include predictive modeling spam or malware detection you can use it for product recommendations we can use it for virtual person assistance etc then comes artificial intelligence so artificial intelligence with python is a dream come true for any programmer uh, the library support like OpenCV, tensorflow pytorch etc provide an ensemble of implementations to put your ideas into reality some of the prominent work that you can include are natural language generation speech recognition sentiment analysis and object detection etc so these are only a few applications of python that i have told you about for more on python applications check out edireka blog space the link is in the description box below some of the projects that you can work on to get an edge over other python programmers include chatbots speech recognition object detection game development etc so these are a few projects that you can work on simultaneously while working on python or learning python that will give you an edge over other programmers because you know once you have an hands-on experience on working on these projects you will understand all the analogies or everything all the processes that goes on into making a project from scratch and these are very interesting projects that you like working on so making a chatbot is very easy on python guys you have a library called chatbot that you can simply use to make a chatbot or you can make it using tensorflow as well for object detection you have open cv and you can make models for digit classification using the mnist data on machine learning you also have a library support which is called speech recognition so you can simply put it inside your program and use it to make a speech recognition model and for game development you can have tk inter that is a gui library or you can use python kiwi to make all these fun games and put it inside an app or you can simply use a pi development game library but that is pi game so all these simple projects that you should work on while doing or beginning your journey with python programming guys although there are certain key points that every beginner struggles with at some point in their journey with python so i'm going to talk about the most common mistakes that a beginner can make while learning python so first of all they don't know where to start so as a beginner the biggest mistake that you can make is not knowing where to start first of all you have to know where you're starting with python programming language because there's an immense possibility with python the applications are immense and you use it for various purposes altogether so you have to know where you're starting from you're starting from basics or you want to start from advanced level or you want to start with machine learning data science or you want to learn artificial intelligence from the starting with python that you have to make a choice after this the second mistake a beginner can make is rigorous learning without any structure which basically means you're learning anything that comes across as python so if you find a tutorial on python on internet or anywhere else you're just learning it see so let's say i'm talking about python beginner learning basic concepts like variables data types etc and suddenly you want to jump to artificial intelligence or suddenly you want to perform data science jobs or suddenly you feel like making a model although with python it is possible that in one go you'll be able to grasp the concept but you have to follow a certain structure to be able to reach that level where it will be easier for you to work on any model irrespective of whatever you have learned or not so for that you have to follow a structure so that is one mistake most beginners make after that irrelevant learning is the next mistake that you can make so let's say you want to actually become a data scientist using a python programming language certification or whatever that you're working on but for that you have been using a lot of your time for making predictive modeling or predictive models for ai or deep learning or something like that but in essence when you talk about data science 
it's not about making predictive models. It's not actually about making all those models to predict some values or making chatbots. It's not about data science is about providing a solution to your organization or if you're working for an organization a data scientist would give solutions to problems using data. So if you are a data scientist and you have begun your journey with Python and you don't know basic tasks like gathering data and loading it into a data set and how you slice the data or make visualizations and you're simply just going on training the data and making predictive models. It's not going to work for you. That's irrelevant at the point if you are a beginner. So you have to keep in mind that you follow a particular structure and the learning should not be irrelevant because if you learn the advanced structure in the beginning and you leave all the basic stuff you're gonna have to come back again and learn the basic stuff and then again you have to learn the advanced structure again. So you are actually spending a lot of time in irrelevant learning that's gonna frustrate you to a level that you start hating Python which is not the case with any programmer if you learn Python the right way. The last mistake that a beginner can actually make is not paying attention to detail. So a lot of time when you find tutorials on online or on internet you only catch up on the flashy stuff. So let's say if I'm making a chatbot in Python. So you'll only check for the code that I've written on a blog or a tutorial. You'll not go inside and take a look at what's going on actually or how the program actually works or the libraries that are already there. How did I download them? How did I install them? So when I was making a speech recognition model, I faced a lot of difficulty into installing Pi audio. And to my surprise when I looked it for online, most of the people had that same query because they were all making the same mistake. They were not paying attention to the detail. The important thing was first to install all the libraries according to the project that you are making. You have to install certain specific version for it to work for your model or your project. I was not paying attention to that. That's why I was facing that difficulty. So if you are a beginner, you are bound to make that mistake. And in order to avoid all these mistakes as a beginner, there are a few things that you have to keep in mind. So first of all, you have to follow a structured learning path and then you can follow a curriculum setup which will actually guide you into a structured learning. And then you can learn and implement as well like whatever you're learning, you implement it. You get hands on experience, make projects. That's going to help you in long run. After that, you need expert guidance as well. Like when you face a difficulty, you should not you like expose yourself to frustration and putting so much time into finding out solutions. Just ask an expert like who is already working on it who has faced the same problem again and again and had already solved it. Just ask the expert and you can just get away with it. And now comes the part where Edureka can help you become a Python programming expert with hands on experience and projects. So Edureka has an instructor led interactive session class recordings. We have 24 7 support industry level matching projects and then we have a lifetime access and a certification which will give you a curriculum which is set up for and we have a curriculum that is matching the industry standards which will help you become a Python programmer in the truest essence of it. So whatever you're learning you're learning from the curriculum that is matching the industry standards. So if you're going for a job or you're looking for a job you have a certification with the curriculum which is matching the industry standards. So you are already ahead of a lot of programmers that are self learned and lack a perspective of what's actually true and what is going to help them in the future when they're working for an organization. So let's say I'm a self learner. I work on different projects, but I don't really know how to implement it for my organization. Let's say if I get employed in an organization and if I have a problem that I have to solve using the data that is given at my disposal. I wouldn't be able to do it because I have no experience with the hands on projects that we have with Edureka. So this is one thing that Edureka will help you into becoming a Python programmer easily. So we have a Python certification training. The course fees is something like this. It is a 14 modules course and we have real time projects that will get you ahead in your career. So with this we have come to the end of the session guys. Tell us what you liked in this tutorial in the comments. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them on Edureka community or mention them in the comments as well. And don't forget to subscribe to Edureka for more exciting tutorials and press the bell icon for latest updates on Edureka. And do check out the Edureka Python certification program. The link is given in the description box below. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. 
do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to EduRika channel to learn more. Happy learning!